Welcome to the Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm your host, Sam Gill. And uh, for those of you who might be joining for the first time, a basic idea of this show is it's, it's really the op-ed page of our democracy. It's where we take an issue, an idea, a topic, and we go a little deeper. We explore its, its ramifications, uh, its contours. Um, and in the wake of the election, which is still buffeting us uh, as of this recording, the continuing role of technology in our democracy, which we've been discussing you know, all summer, all fall on the show, has just been thrown into stark relief. Um, to some extent, it seems that what you read online may dictate you know, whether you think Joe Biden is the legitimate or illegitimate president-elect. And by the way, there is no evidence for any other conclusion uh, than that he is the president-elect, PSA for a second here. Um, but questions continue to abound about the role of technology, not only in our, our civic and political discourse, but in the structure of our economy. And a lot of this discussion tends to focus on the so-called FANG companies, F-A-N-G, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. But the senior statesman in the sector continues to be Microsoft. It was around, the company's been around for decades before these newer entrants. And as of the third quarter, is the second largest company in the U.S. by market cap. And so my guest today is well-versed in all these topics. Mary Snap is no stranger to these discussions. She leads diverse strategic community and external efforts at Microsoft. And before that, she was a lawyer with the company during the antitrust battles of the 90s. Uh, we had a chance to sit down for a wide-ranging conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, well, Mary, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, thanks. So I think uh, the place I, I wanna start is, you know, we're recording this in, you know, what feels what is week two of a presidential election process that's not close to over, and um, certainly I think for the first time that I can remember, the the question of technology and the internet is just right at the center of our discussion about the election. In part because of concerns uh, about the kind of information that's moving. Through the through through the internet and whether it's reinforcing concerns about voter fraud, in part because the incumbent president himself is taking to to social media in particular, and even today now concerns about the very policies kind of intended to curb misinformation getting in the way of this runoff election in Georgia, where you've got candidates that want to actively advertise and take advantage of the democratizing aspect of technology. So in some ways, it's it's just. There's there's no question in our democracy that sort of feels disconnected from questions about technology. And just as someone who's helping to lead a company that's been at the forefront of these questions for decades, um, you know what what are you talking about at Microsoft about the about the kind of the role of information technology in our democracy and what's new and what's not new for you? Yeah, that's a huge question. And I would say you know what aren't we talking about really? You know, everything from, you know, data and our Azure business all the way to thinking about social media and regulation. But be, before we really get into it, I just want to like do a shout out, speaking of technology, to um, an article I saw recently about what are called the new chart throbs. The guys who are, you know, on television who show us the maps and they go in and yeah. out of the data and they can count the votes and they can do the math and the algorithms are all behind them. And that to me is like a great example of the use of technology to keep us up to date and informed on all the things we can do. But, you know, there's just no question that um, social media has played a huge role in spreading uh, good information and not so good information about the election itself. There's, I mean, I, so just, you know, one, and I, and I don't want to put you in the position in this conversation of like, speaking for technology as a, as a, as a sector. Um, but you, you know, Microsoft's one of the most capitalized, best capitalized companies in the world and you play in all these spaces. You know, there is this, particularly right now because social media companies are trying to adjust their policies in response to what's happening. Yeah. There is this kind of cynicism about, you know, what, do you just care about profit? Do you care about the democracy? Take us a little bit inside, like when you're talking as, corporate leaders, as engineers, and you're confronting these challenges, whether it's deep fakes and synthetic media or misinformation, what's what's like the nature of the discussion? Um, what are you grappling with? Well, it's really interesting because it's a multidisciplinary approach. So, you know, you're talking to engineers, you're talking to lawyers, 
you're talking to people who are public policy folks, you're, you're talking to actually ethicists. And I think it's really important for us to bring the voices of people in Microsoft Research and others into, into that conversation. And I would say whew, probably the biggest awakening for us uh, was the Christchurch um, killing about, I think about two years ago, year and a half ago, when technology was used to preview that and to video that. And within like two days, we had a, our, our lead lawyer in Australia talking to the heads of government and came back and tried to put together a coalition of other tech companies to create some principles. So as we think about you know, what we do, we sort of start from this framework about what are the principles that we should employ as a company and what are the principles with our competitors, you know, we can, we can agree on, on some of the uses of technology. I would also say that, you know, Microsoft, perhaps because of its history, in part because of its history, in part because of a leadership from a guy like Brad Smith and a CEO like Satya who grew up, you know, in a, in a different sort of a regulated environment, frankly, in India. Um, there is a little bit more of an acceptance of the role of regulation in managing some of these things. I mean, from our perspective, you know, these are really important decisions that you're making about privacy, about ethical uses of artificial intelligence. And frankly, nobody elected us, nobody voted for us. So, you know, it's important for us to talk about issues, to put a stake in the ground on them, but ultimately, this stuff kind of needs to be legislated and we need to make information broadly available both to citizens and our own employees. And I, I guess I'd say the last thing on this topic, well, there's lots of things on this topic, but we, you can't underestimate increasingly the role that our own employees play in being activists on these issues and asking us to get involved and take public positions and to make ethical decisions about technology. And that's something we didn't see 10 years ago. Mm. We, I don't know that we even really saw it five years ago, but you know, as a result of, I think kind of dissipation of trust in some parts of, of um, society and sectors in society, our employees are telling us that they don't wanna work for us, frankly, <laughs> unless you know, they agree with some of the values and that's important too. Yeah, I think, you know, that is a really interesting trend. And I think it's taking over a lot of sectors, particularly in the knowledge economy, that you've got a workforce that really wants to see its ethical commitments reflected in the, in the, the company. And I, I, I want to come back to this question of responsibility and accountability, but just to, to play that out a bit, I mean, is this, is, do you, do you see this, is this, is this ephemeral or do you think this is this is going to be a new relationship between a, a company and its and its workforce that's ultimately going to shape the the business. I, you know, this is my personal point of view, but I I would bet I would find others who agree with me. This is not ephemeral. Um, this is a generation of workers who are in high demand, uh, who are increasingly saying they're going to work from home too. You know, so that mm -hmm. you've got that level of distance now. Uh, I, I think this is a long-term trend. I don't think it's ephemeral. And I think, um, you know, you start back long before that, but remember a couple of years ago when Larry uh, Fink from uh, BlackRock wrote the, you know, his end of year letter. And he said, you know, consumers are, and employees are both demanding that companies have a social purpose and they make that purpose known. And whether or not that's the brand of philanthropy in which they engage, whether it's the public issues that they want to talk about, uh, whether it's questions related to do we put artificial intelligence in, uh, you know, provide, you know, in products to the Department of Defense. I mean, these are all questions that, I mean, as technology hurdles forward, the ethical implications of it become more and more and more significant. And, you know, that goes to our core. So. I don't think these issues are short-lived. I think they are. I think they are long-term. Well, that and that does bring me back to these these questions of responsibility that you raised about regulation, which is, you know, I, so it's, to some extent, 
the idea that companies have some relationship to the public interest and to social purpose isn't wholly new. The language is new, but you know, it's the corporate sector in America that first created paid leave. It didn't come from government. And even, even though at times we have to kind of codify the restraints of managerial capitalism, you know, it, we didn't we didn't need the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to know that bribery was wrong. We just we needed it to police the edges right. of of behavior that we knew was not was not appropriate behavior, um, right. and that and that the and the balance between between corporate interest and public interest was was something that we were all committed to. I guess when I listen to you, it just strikes me that the challenges for figuring out one's responsibility are different in a technologically mediated era. And also that the something about the speed and the scale, like Christchurch brings home a kind of challenge right. that is a kind of responsibility that maybe we didn't realize yeah. uh, was going to be vested at least partially in the corporate sector. Is do you see do you see growing awareness about that? Like I think some people would say these are institutions now in in some sort of technical sense. What what's what's your sensibility about this? Well, I I definitely think that. You know, corporations need to have a responsibility, obviously, uh, to their stakeholders, and that's not the shareholders. I mean, the stakeholders. That's that's consumers. That's other businesses that take advantage of our products and services, and it's our own employees. And that you know, that is very different than you know some class you might have taken on business capitalism thirty years ago. Right. I just don't think that you you can you can get away from that. Um, I also think that the speed, you've talked about the speed of technology, you know, as you sort of think about it, you know, it took like almost a hundred years for telephones when they were first introduced to kind of reach this saturation point of like, you know, 80% of American households. You know, I was just thinking about that this morning with this podcast in like less than 10 years, you know, we're at about 35% saturation of people who listen to podcasts. So in another 10 years, you know, maybe 15, probably shorter, because it's going to accelerate, we'll have more people listening to podcasts at a faster rate than got telephones in the United States. And to some extent, you know, the infrastructure has been laid, you know, so we've got the electrical lines. Um, We've got, we don't have last mile connectivity, which is another big issue, but we do have um, broader connectivity. So that infrastructure is laid. These technological advances are going to go faster and faster. And frankly, COVID has done nothing but accelerate all of the trends to more reliance on technology. You know, I think the flip side of that, I'm kind of riffing now, as you can tell, but the flip side of that is that it also is increasing some social isolation. Yeah. And if you think about that, I think that builds into uh, an, an increased um, um, vulnerability to disinformation, to deep fakes. And I think then, you know, you come back to what is the responsibility of technology to respond to that? And you can talk about it in terms of you know, trying to get people more civic information or more media literacy, but there's a real technological cat and mouse game going on between technology companies and those who are spreading disinformation with, you know, what, you know, we call synthetic media and manipulated synthetic media, not just how you um, stop it, but how you prevent it. And that is going to excel, it already has accelerated as well. So you think about this last election and, um, you know, you saw Microsoft taking responsibility like every starting, I don't know, six or eight months ago, every couple of months, a guy named Tom Burt, who leads our cybersecurity efforts, was posting blogs about cyber attacks and what's been detected and the kinds of services that are being offered to campaigns and government officials. Um, we participate, I mean, I really didn't think about it much uh, until a month or so before the election, wondering what, you know, some of these um, bots that uh, seek to infect computers um, for ransom, whether or not ransomware would be part of the story we'd be telling, you know, in the 2020 elections, whether it's whole, I mean, what would happen if Pennsylvania had been shut down because, 
you know, a hacker had gotten in and demanded ransom, you know, from the state government before it um, undid the lock on the computer system. So, you know, there's just more and more responsibility for tech companies to think about technological solutions. And first and foremost, that's that's our greatest asset. That's where we know the most. And there's absolutely, you know, a role that we need to play, but it's ongoing. It is absolutely ongoing. You know, the bad guys get better and better and better. And, you know, you, you just have to keep that research going. So well, one one dimension of this is, is the question of how to, of how to have a productive dialogue as a society, and e like if we, even if to your point, the answer is that at some point you have to codify some some sort of new regulatory regime into law. That that's going to happen through negotiation and compromise and discussion, and I and certainly that feels elusive at the moment. You've got I think for example, you mentioned Christchurch. I mean I think congressional hearings about issues of content moderation have been among the worst technology hearings of the last year in, the, in, in with respect to the level of sophistication. You've got a lot of frustration um, about, well, can't the company, can't, can't the major company just solve this problem, quote unquote, if they, if they wanted to. So you have a lot of cynicism. But Microsoft, very much unlike some of the kind of newer kids on the block, although it feels odd to call them that given their size, you know, is not a stranger to having to figure out ways to have a productive dialogue with regulators. Yep. Um, and, you know, one of the things I had really want to talk to you about is the experience of the late 90s and, and, <laughs> and concerns about antitrust and what they mean for today or not. But before we get into the into the specific kind of structural economic question, just what do you got? Do you do you think you've learned something, you know, in your career about how to make that conversation about what responsibility ought to look like more productive? Oh, are you kidding? I'm not sure I'd be here if I didn't learn, learn something like literally, you know, by the week on that topic. Yeah, just as a little bit of background, um, you know, um, Sam, that I was uh, deputy general counsel during that time, and I was explicitly responsible in my own work portfolio for Microsoft Windows. And so, um, you know, I was at the antitrust trials in the late, you know, uh, 90s. And I was part of the team along with the antitrust lawyers. I supported the product development for uh, complying with the consent decrees, both in the United States and in Europe. So I, um, you know, uh, at least monthly, I was going to DC to report to the technical committee and quarterly hearings with the judge in that case, and about the same frequency going to the EU to talk to their equivalent, not judges, but, you know, the, the EU leaders. And um, to be honest with you, you know, I started out, look, I love Microsoft. I started out with my arms crossed and my jaw tight and, you know, how could this happen? Um, and that might've been a bit of our culture back then. And I've come to the point where, you know, you just realize that you have to be able to talk from the beginning, work on issues, understand that democracy is compromised, that regulation is compromised. And I will say like a kind of a turning point for us um, was um, when Brad Smith came into the role of general counsel, the, everything moved from litigation to compliance. And Brad came into the role and said, it's time to, literally, it's time to make peace. Um, and we were um, deployed, each of us who were senior leaders. I had four or five state um, attorneys generals that I made quarterly trips to. I talked to them about what we were doing. I asked them what was on their mind. Um, and that was a real change for us. We continue to keep those relationships alive and it's gone far beyond antitrust. We talk about, we talk about issues of privacy. We talk about jobs in the economy. We talk about skills and employability. So, you know, it's, it's, we talk about rural broadband. We, now we're talking about race and social justice and issues of equity and broadband in urban areas. We're talking about how we can help support uh, land grant institutions and historically uh, black universities and colleges. So the range of discussions is actually quite broad. And um, I personally have learned a lot along the way. I, you know, in the late 1990s, I learned that you can't just win a case in the courts, that you also had to win it 
you know, in the court of public opinion. And uh, that was my late 1990s learning. And, you know, most of the last part of my career, both as a lawyer and, you know, working now on some of these other issues has been much more related to how we connect to, again, stakeholders who are not our shareholders. And that's just an important part of how we think about our business these days. I think there's, to me, there's something about, you know, and I, and I know some of, some of, some of our, some of our audience will, will, will complain to me about for saying this, but I, I know well, I, I've always, I've, I've always liked the, 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 that famous line from Brad Smith about it's time to make peace, because I, I think that um, to what I take out of it is we all, we might have a first order interest in winning an election or in profit or in advancing our family, but we should all have a second order interest in the system continuing right. to operate so that we can do all those things right. and have those aspirations. And I've never been a big believer that you have to be the most virtuous person, but I have been a big believer that you have to be willing to check your avarice uh, or your appetite in, 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 in accordance with that second order interest. And so it is interesting to hear about your own, I mean, you use the word culture, which is not yeah. something that comes up a lot in these conversations. And I think there's a real question right now about not only what the right regulatory solutions are or aren't, but what it means to be committed to Right. The idea that there's such a thing as responsibility and as elusive as it is, we're going to have to kind of find it. And what we find may not be the thing that we would have done un unimpeded. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I did, I did use the word culture and it just came out very easily because it's something that we talk about all the time, actually, at Microsoft, we sort of start by talking about culture. And, you know, when Satya came into the role five years ago, he deliberately set out to change the culture. And look, it wasn't just to make us, you know, a, a, a nicer, softer Microsoft. There, there was a lot of talk about culture in creating a more rigorous, um, you know, research and development process, a more rigorous um, work ethic, frankly, uh, a, a focus on, on um, speed as opposed to process to some extent, all in balance. But at the same time, you know, that combination of, of, of Brad, Amy Hood, the CFO, and, and, and Satya, you know, they come from a worldview that is different than, you know, those who entered, you know, this business in the 1980s. I mean, the, we, we are in, a, we, we came from a time where we weren't even talking about the internet, for goodness sake. We came from a time when, you know, you couldn't even type a sentence in email and you, you know, you couldn't correct your spelling, you know? So that's the time at which I came into the company and, you know, the impact and the ways in which technology impacts the world is just so different now. I mean, one of the things that, you know, we've, we've started to talk about is, you know, it's certainly it's important for us to have more computer scientists and there aren't enough computer scientists going to school in the United States, but the computer scientists need to take history classes. Computer mm -hmm. scientists needs to, those needs to go to the philosophy department and take an ethics class. Um, I mean, it's really hard to talk about privacy by design in your products if you don't have an understanding, for example, of what happened in Germany, you know, in the late 1930s, mm. in terms of the amount of intrusion in, into lives that the government had. So, you know, you, you have to, you have to, I think assimilate that if you're really going to be part of sectors in society moving moving us forward. I don't know. I could I could go on about the you know the Microsoft stuff, but I you know I think about you know just in terms of democracy, you know there's the there's the checks and balances that we I actually went down. I went and read the Constitution again like last week. You know I probably am one of I mean I think there are a number of people who did, but maybe not that many. I read it again. Everyone binged it. It was trending. We binged on the Constitution. The Constitution. Yes. <laughs> but I realized that a lot of the things that we're saying, oh, you know, we're just going to get rid of the Electoral College. Oh, we're going to change the makeup of the Senate. That's in the Constitution. It's actually not that easy to no. change. And it was deliberately put there to put restraints on one, um, one group or sector getting more power over another. Um, and at the same time, you know, you think about, okay, now I'm going to be really careful about what I say. 
you think about what are the restraints right now in, um, in our own civility? And have those restraints been loosened and, 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 and they disappeared a little bit because of social media and kind of a lack of accountability of, of, of people on platforms. And so, you know, that's one of the questions of our time, I think. Well, let me, let me, the last issue I want to talk about in related, related now more topically to the, to the antitrust, uh, to the antitrust and competition question, kind of 21 years on from the, from the initial court order for, for Microsoft, but is, is actually about power. So it's actually a great, great reminder. So, you know, so much of the concern of the founders was, was the concentration of power and a particular kind of majoritarian tyranny and avoiding that. And that animated social policy, political, uh, political culture, the public culture, and economic policy for a long time. And what's been really interesting in terms of a difference between the late 90s and today is that the, the competition question about technology is explicitly much more referential to the late 19th century and questions about power and corporate power as a threat to democracy than it is about sort of 70s, 80s consumer welfare doctrine. What's, what is, what's in the interest of the consumer, particularly focused on price, but other things as well. And the question I want, I don't want to ask you sort of an uncomfortable question about your competitors, but let me ask a sort of different yeah. question along the lines of the nuance that you've been inviting us to embrace in this conversation, which is the way the questions being posed now is have, have, have technology companies become too big? And I guess the question I would ask you is, what are the right, what, let's take it a level down. What are the right specific questions that we should be asking about technology and the size of companies in power that will help us move this discussion forward? Yeah, well, you hit on one of them. Um, and that is, is the focus in, um, in how we gauge whether there's harm. Is that focus on competition or is that focus on consumer harm? And that was a question that we really debated in the 90s, and it was a it was a question that was um, debated in the you know the oil companies and all of those kinds of issues too, railroads you know back in the day, and in those early doctrines, it was all about as long as consumers are benefiting, you know, if competition suffers a little, that's okay as long as you know it went down to price. If prices went up. Then consumers weren't benefiting, and you know, if there were lower prices, it was kind of the end of the discussion. I think it's much more nuanced now. I think we're we're coming. We actually, I think, coming back to that question about competitor harm. Um, but I think that question of consumer harm is is going to be really important. I think there is a real convergence now between traditional antitrust law and um, privacy. And um, intellectual, before in the 90s, we were talking about power related to, in essence, intellectual property. You know, our technology, copyright, patents, did we allow people to use things? Did we allow people inside, you know, that we talked talk about APIs, you know, and did could people have access to these things that let you into what we called the kernel of the system so that you could, you know, all that wonky stuff. But, you know, now we we really honestly we're talking about data, we're talking about data now. Who has access to how much data, and will they share it, and is it interoperable, and how value is the data, and do consumers get value for their data? Do they care to get value for their data? Um, and I think that question about data, you know, it's just kind of fundamentally, and how data is then used to um, get more. Um, uh, followers, more advertising, that fundamental question about data is just really different. And the businesses that are impacted by, you know, tech are just much broader than they were before. You know, everything from, you know, local media, what I know you really care about, to retail, to, you know, what you would think about as pure competitors. So the questions are just really, I think, much more um, woven together. It's almost like a carpet weaving of issues these days compared to just a focus on, you know, copyright and patent, which is what we talked a lot about, you know, in the 1990s. I feel like we're ending on the equivalent of a technology cliffhanger 
uh, with that with that provocative response. But like the election, end we must at some point. So uh, you can follow Mary on Twitter at Mary E. Snap, uh, and also read uh, many of her public contributions uh, on behalf of Microsoft at blogs.microsoft.com. But Mary, thank you so much for joining us. You are most welcome. It was fun. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Just remember, we are changing our schedule a bit. So always keep an eye at kf.org or at the Sam Gill on Twitter for info on new episodes. Uh, and as a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later. You can listen to or watch this episode or any episode on demand at kf.org slash fdshow. And you can also subscribe to the Future of Democracy podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Email us anytime, fdshow at kf.org, or if you have questions for me, just send me a note on Twitter, at the Sam Gill. As always, we're gonna, gonna serenade you out with the music of Miami singer-songwriter, Nick County. You can follow him on Spotify. Until next week, stay safe. Thanks so much. Inside.